Sorry about that, folks. It seems like I was disconnected as I was in the middle of reading the text. So I'm going to go back to that. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to make sure that this is posted in two parts, okay? And again, maybe you don't need to read aloud, but I do want to provide it to you all. Um, you do have access to it through uh, Common Lit, through the website. So again, if you have a Chromebook, this is a much easier way than probably sitting there and listening to me read it. Because as you know, I've been stopping and talking about you know my annotations and such as we go. But from here on out, what I'm going to do just for the sake of time and just for the sake of kind of setting a standard is since I've already annotated the text, I'm going to reveal the annotations and talk more about my annotations tomorrow when we re revisit the text. And from here on out, I'm just going to read the rest of the story because as you can see, we still have a little ways to go. But where I believe it cut me out was right here uh, when I was talking about Mike's initial thoughts about his grandmother as far as him revealing that to us and you know what he thinks about her. So I'm going to pick up right here at the end of the highlighted text. And again, I apologize for those out there that are watching this. I cannot piece the two videos together. I'm already trying to think about it, but whatever. Anyway, we're moving on. My mother visits her all the time, driving the 30 miles to lawn rest almost every day. Because Annie was at home for semester break from college, we had decided to make a special Saturday visit. Now Annie was in bed, groaning theatrically. She's a drama major, but I told my mother I'd go anyway. I hadn't seen my grandmother since she'd been admitted to lawn rest because the place is located on the Southwest Turnpike, which meant I could barrel along in my father's new Le Mans. My ambition was to see the speedometer hit 75. Ordinarily, I used the old station wagon, which can barely stagger up to 50. Frankly, I wasn't too crazy about visiting a nursing home. They reminded me of hospitals, and hospitals turned me off. I mean, the smell of ether makes me nauseous, and I feel faint at the sight of blood. And as I approached Lawn Rest, which is a terrible cemetery kind of name to begin with, I was sorry I hadn't avoided the trip. Then I felt guilty about it. I'm loaded with guilt complexes, like driving like a madman after promising my father to be careful, like sitting in the parking lot looking at the nursing home with dread and thinking how I'd rather be with Cindy. Then I thought of all the Christmas and birthday gifts my grandmother had given me, and I got out of the car, guilty as usual. Inside, I was surprised by the lack of hospital smell, although the, there was another odor, or maybe the absence of an odor. The air was antiseptic, sterile, as if there was no atmosphere at all, or I'd caught a cold suddenly and couldn't taste or smell. A nurse at the reception desk gave me directions. My grandmother was in East 3. I made my way down the tiled corridor and was glad to see that the walls were painted with cheerful colors like yellow and pink. A wheelchair suddenly shot around a corner, self-propelled by an old man, white-haired and toothless, who cackled merrily as he barely missed me. I jumped aside. Here I was, almost getting wiped out by a two-mile-an-hour wheelchair after doing 75 on the pike. As I walked through the corridor, seeking East 3, I couldn't help glancing into the rooms, and it was like some kind of wax museum. All these figures in various stances and attitudes, sitting in beds or chairs, standing at windows, as if they were frozen forever in these postures. To tell the truth, I began to hurry because I was getting depressed. Finally, I saw a beautiful girl approaching, dressed in white, a nurse or an attendant, and I was so happy to see someone young, someone walking and acting normally, that I gave her a wide smile and a big hello, and I must have looked kind of like a nut. Anyway, she looked right through me as if I were a window, which is about par for the course whenever I meet beautiful girls. I finally found the room and saw my grandmother in bed. My grandmother looks like Ethel Barrymore. I never knew who Ethel Barrymore was until I saw a terrific movie, None But the Lonely Heart, on TV starring Eth Ethel Barrymore and Cary Grant. Both my grandmother and Ethel Barrymore have the, these great craggy faces like the side of a mountain and wonderful voices like syrup being poured. Slowly, she was propped up in bed, pillows puffed be behind her. Her hair had been combed out and fell upon her shoulders. For some reason, this flowing hair gave her an almost girlish appearance, despite its whiteness. She saw me and smiled. Her eyes lit up and her eyebrows arched and she reached out her hands to me in greeting. 
Mike, Mike, she said, and I breathed a sigh of relief. This is one of her good days. My mother warned me that she might not know who I was at first. I want to take note of that. I was going to highlight that sentence. I get that one too. This was one of her good days. I know I said I wasn't going to do this, but sorry, guys. I took her hands in mine. They were fragile. I could actually feel her bones, and it seemed as if they would break if I pressed too hard. Her skin was smooth, almost slippery, as if the years had worn away all the roughness, the way the wind wears away the surfaces of stones. Mike, Mike, I didn't think you'd come, she said so happy, and she was still Ethel Barrymore, that voice like a caress. I've been waiting all this time. Before I could reply, she looked away out the window. See the birds? I've been watching them at the feeder. I love to see them come. Even the blue jays. The blue jays are like hawks. They take the food that the small birds should have. But the small birds, the chickadees, watch the blue jays and at least learn where the feeder is. She lapsed into silence and I looked out the window. There was no feeder, no birds. There was only the parking lot and sun glinting on car windshields. She turned to me again, eyes bright, radiant, really. Or was it a medicine brightness? Ah, Mike, you look so grand, so grand. Is that a new coat? Not really, I said. I'd been wearing my Uncle Jerry's old army fatigue jacket for months, practically living in it, my mother said. But she insisted that I wear my raincoat for the visit. It was about a year old, but looked new because I didn't wear it much. Nobody was wearing raincoats lately. You always loved clothes, didn't you, Mike? She said. I was beginning to feel uneasy because she regarded me with such intensity. Those bright eyes, I wondered, are old people in places like this so lonesome, so abandoned, that they go wild when someone visits? Or was she so happy because she was suddenly lucid and everything was sharp and clear? My mother had described those moments when my grandmother suddenly emerged from the fog that so often obscured her mind. I didn't know the answers, but it felt kind of spooky getting such an emotional welcome from her. I remember the time you bought the new coat, the Chesterfield, she said, looking away again, as if watching the birds that weren't there. That lovely coat with the velvet collar, black, it was, stylish. Remember that, Mike? It was hard times, but you couldn't, could never resist the glitter. I was about to protest. I had never heard of a Chesterfield for crying out loud, but I stopped. Be patient with her, my mother had said. Humor her. Be gentle. We were interrupted by an attendant who pushed a wheeled cart into the room. Time for juices, dear, the woman said. She was the standard 40 or 50 year old woman. Glasses, nothing hair, plump cheeks. Her manner was cheerful, but a business like kind of cheerfulness. I'd hate to be called dear by someone getting paid to do it. Orange or grape or cranberry, dear. Cranberry is good for the bones, you know. My grandmother ignored the interruption. She didn't, she didn't even bother to answer, having turned away at the woman's arrival as if angry about her appearance. The woman looked at me and winked, a conspirator conspiratorial kind of wink. It was kind of horrible. I didn't think people winked like that anymore. In fact, I hadn't seen a wink in years. She doesn't care much for juices, the woman said, talking to me as if grandmother weren't even there. But she loves her coffee with lots of cream and two lumps of sugar. But this is juice time, not coffee time, addressing my grandmother again, she said. Orange or grape or cranberry, dear. Tell her I want no juices, Mike, my grandmother commanded regally, her eyes still watching invisible birds. The woman smiled, patience like a label of, on her face. That's all right, dear. I'll just leave some cranberry for you. Drink it at your leisure. It's good for the bones. She wheeled herself out of the room. My grandmother was still absorbed in the view. Somewhere, a toilet flushed. A wheelchair passed the doorway, probably that same old driver fleeing a hit-run accident. A television set exploded with sound somewhere. Soap opera voices filling the air. You can always tell soap opera voices. I turned back to find my grandmother staring at me. Her hands cupped her face. Her index fingers curled around her cheeks like parentheses marks. But you know, Mike, looking back, I think you were right, she said, continuing our conversation if, as if there had been no interruption. You always said, it's the things of the spirit that count, Meg, the spirit. And so you bought the baby grand piano, a baby grand in the middle of the depression. 
a knock came on the door and it was the delivery man. It took five of them to get into the house. She leaned back, closing her eyes. How I love that piano, Mike. I was never that fine a player, but you love to sit there in the parlor on Sunday evenings, Ellie on your lap, listening to me play and sing. She hummed a bit, a fragment of melody I didn't recognize. Then she drifted into silence. Maybe she'd fallen asleep. My mother's name is Ellen, but everyone call, always calls her Ellie. Take my hand, Mike, my grandmother said suddenly. Then I remembered my grandfather's name was Michael. I had been named for him. So I think Mike is coming to the realization that his grandmother thinks that he is her grand is his grandfather. He the, this is confusing, but the grandmother thinks that Michael is his grandfather. She thinks that it's her husband. Ah, Mike, she said, pressing my hands with all her feeble strength. I thought I'd lost you forever, and here you are, back with me again. Her expression scared me. I don't mean scared as if I were in danger, but scared because of what could happen to her when she realized the mistake she'd made. My mother always said I favored her side of the family. Thinking back to the pictures in the old family albums, I recall my grandfather as tall and thin like me, but the resemblance ended there. He was 35 when he died almost 40 years ago, and he wore a mustache. I brought my hand to my face. I also wore a mustache now, of course. I sit here these days, Mike, she said, her voice a lullaby, her hand still holding mine, and I drift and dream. The days are fuzzy sometimes, merging together. Sometimes it's like I'm not here at all, but somewhere else altogether. And I always think of you, those years we had. Not enough years, Mike, not enough. Her voice was so sad, so mournful, that I made sounds of sympathy. Not words exactly, but the kind of soothings that mothers murmur to their children when they awaken from bad dreams. And I think of that terrible night, Mike, that terrible night. Have you ever really forgiven me for that night? Listen, I began, I wanted to say, Nana, this is Mike, your grandson, not Mike, your husband. Shh, shh, she whispered, placing a finger as long and cold as a candle against my lips. Don't say anything. I've waited so long for this moment to be here with you. I wondered what I would say if suddenly you walked in that door like other people have done. I've thought and thought about it, and I finally made up my mind. I'd ask you to forgive me. I was too proud to ask before. Her fingers tried to mask her face, but I'm not proud anymore, Mike. That great voice quivered and then grew strong again. I hate you to see me this way. You always said I was beautiful. I didn't believe it. The charity ball when we led the grand march, and you said I was the most beautiful girl there. Nana, I said. I couldn't keep up the pretense any longer, adding one more bird into my load of guilt, leading her on this way, playing a pathetic game of make-believe with an old woman clinging to memories. She didn't seem to hear me. So Mike tries to stop her, but she just keeps going on. Just checking on the recording. Looks like we're going good so far. Again, sorry about the disconnection earlier. But that other night, Mike, the terrible one, the terrible accusations I made, even Ellie woke up and began to cry. I, want, I went to her and rocked her in my arms, and you came into the room and said I was wrong. You were whispering an awful whisper, not wanting to upset little Ellie, but wanting to make me see the truth. And I didn't answer you, Mike. I was too proud. I've even forgotten the name of the girl. I sit here wondering now, was it Laura or Evelyn? I can't remember. Later I learned that you were telling the truth all the time, Mike, that I'd been wrong. Her eyes were brighter than ever as she looked at me now, but tear bright, the, uh, the tears gathering. It was never the same after that night, was it, Mike? The glitter was gone from you, from us, and then the accident, and I never had the chance to ask you to forgive me. My grandmother, my poor, poor grandmother, old people aren't supposed to have those kinds of memories. You see their pictures in the family albums, and that's what they are, pictures. They're not supposed to come to life. You drive out in your father's Le Mans doing 75 on the pike, and all you're doing is visiting an old lady in a nursing home, a duty call, and then you find out that she's a person. She's somebody. She's my grandmother, all right, but she's also herself. Like my own mother and father, they, are, they exist outside of their relationship to me. I was scared again. I wanted to get out of there. 
Mike, Mike, my grandmother said. Say it, Mike. I felt as if my cheeks would crack if I uttered a word. Say you forgive me, Mike. I've waited all these years. I was surprised at how strong her fingers were. Say, I forgive you, Meg. I said it. My voice sounded funny, as if I were talking in a huge tunnel. I forgive you, Meg. Her eyes studied me. Her hands pressed mine. For the first time in my life, I saw love at work. Not movie love. Not Cindy's sparkling eyes when I tell her that we're going to the beach on a Sunday afternoon. But love like something alive and tender, asking nothing in return. She raised her face, and I knew that she wanted what she wanted me to do. I bent and brushed my lips against her cheek. Her flesh was like a leaf in autumn's crisp and dry that's kind of gross i'm sorry guys so he just kissed his grandmother but the description of the skin ugh. she closed her eyes and i stood up the sun wasn't glinting on the cars any longer somebody had turned on another television set and the voices were the show-off voices of the sh panel shows at the same time you could still hear the soap opera dialogue on the other television set i waited a while she seemed to be sleeping, her breathing serene and regular. I buttoned my raincoat. Suddenly, she opened her eyes again and looked at me. Her eyes were still bright, but they merely stared at me without recognition or curiosity. Empty eyes. I smiled at her, but she didn't smile back. She made a kind of moaning sound and turned away on the bed, pulling the blankets around her. I counted to 25 and then to 50 and did it all over again. I cleared my throat and coughed tentatively. She didn't move. She didn't respond. I wanted to say, Nana, it's me, but I didn't. I thought of saying, Meg, it's me, but I couldn't. Finally, I left. Just like that. I didn't say goodbye or anything. I stalked through the corridors, looking neither to the right nor the left, not caring whether that wild old man with the wheelchair ran me down or not. On the southwest turnpike, I did 75. No 80. Most of the way, I turned the radio up as loud as it could go. Rock music, anything to fill the air. When I got home, my mother was vacuuming the living room rug. She shut off the cleaner, and the silence was deafening. Well, how is your grandmother, she asked. I told her she was fine. I told her a lot of things, how great Nana looked and how she seemed happy and had called me Mike. I wanted to ask her, hey, Mom, you and Dad really love each other, don't you? I mean, there's nothing to forgive between you, is there? But I didn't. Instead, I went upstairs and took out the electric razor Annie had given me for Christmas and shaved off my mustache. All right, so that's the conclusion of the text, but I just want to point out some things. So clearly, you know, Mike's grandmother, you know, confused him for her, you know, husband who passed away many years ago. And it seems like she had accused her husband of having an extramarital affair uh, with another woman. And you know, she wants the husband to forgive her for accusing him because he, you know, the truth is that he never had, you know, uh, he never had cheated on her. So then at the end, we get this piece here when Mike's kind of, you know, questioning the, you know, wants the question at least whether his parents have, you know, you know similar secrets to hide. Um, so that's kind of the whole point of that. But I do want to point something out. I want to highlight this. I told her she was fine. I told her a lot of things, how great Nana looked, right? This is Mike lying. Again, just again, showing you the annotation tool. Mike is lying to his mother to protect her from being sad about his grandmother's condition. I think the other thing is that he lies to her because maybe the mother doesn't know about this, you know, whole accusation of, you know, uh, her dad cheating on her mom. So maybe that's part of um, Mike protecting his mother and saying, you know, all's fine with grandma in the nursing home. So again, we'll get more to these annotations tomorrow. I want to take you now to the pre-writing graphic organizer. And again, if you've watched both sessions of this video, thank you so much. As you can see, it is a long text. And I did want to provide a read aloud in case you're not on a computer. You don't have access to the read aloud button. But if you don't have access to a computer, I definitely highly recommend uh, that you get in touch with the school and try to get your hands on a Chromebook uh, because some of these tools are definitely super helpful. As you can see, they really helped me to track my understanding of the story.
All right, gonna take you now to the pre-writing graphic organizer. So as I told you before, in the first part of this video, uh, the pre-writing graphic organizer is the assignment that you're required to complete today in addition to reading and annotating the text. So it, once you click on this, it would open up to the pre-writing graphic organizer. Now I'm gonna share my teacher edition of the pre-writing graphic organizer with everyone. However, it's only gonna be available for you guys to view, all right? This document here is a workable document that's personalized for you, all right? You just you know uh, open that and it creates your own copy in your Google Drive. So let's take a look at the pre-writing graphic organizer. It reminds us that at the end of this distance learning set, you will write a multi-paragraph essay answering the essential question, why is it difficult to understand other people? After you have completed each reading assignment, use the chart below to help you remember how that text answered the essential question. So what we have is a chart here and that includes our three texts, the mustache, we wear the mask, and soul painting ink. And we need to complete this after our first read of the text. So the first part of the organizer says, how does this text answer the essential question? So here's what I wrote. I said, the text shows that it is difficult to understand other people because they have secrets that they are not always forthcoming with. For instance, Mike did not know about the problems with his grandparents' mad marriage until his grandmother revealed it to, to him, it should say, excuse me. He always thought things were fine and dandy between his grandparents. This also makes him wonder about the relationship of his own parents. Eventually, he comes to the realization that all people come with baggage, right? And he mentions that, you know, your relationship with somebody, you know, people have relationships outside of their relationship with you. So, you know, you don't really necessarily know all the ins and outs of every single person uh, that, you know, is out there. You don't know all of their secrets and all of that, okay? So that's how I think this text helps us answer this question, why it's difficult to understand other people, because we, again, it's, it's difficult to understand them because we don't necessarily know everything about them. So here are some quotes from the text that I chose. Uh, and again, you want to include the paragraph number um, as far as where it came from. So I had some evidence I, I selected from paragraph 45, 46, and 59. The quotes read as follows. It was never the same after that night, was it, Mike? The glitter was gone from you, from us. Now, I chose this quote because, again, this is where, you know, she, she, you know, Mike realizes that, you know, like, there was some sort of cheating accusation uh, going on between his grandparents that he had never previously known about. I chose this quote here, and then you find out that she's a person, she's somebody, she's my grandmother, all right, but she's also herself. Again, because I think that really helps us to understand, like Mike says, that people have relationships with others outside of you, and that might be a reason why it's difficult to understand somebody. Like you might not know, you know, for instance, like um, somebody's parents might have been killed in a car accident, and here you are joking about a car accident, you know, it's difficult to understand like where they're coming from because. You st might still have your parents, whereas their parents, you know, died in a car accident, unfortunately, uh, two totally different situations. So it's difficult to understand other people because we don't have exposure to all of their relationships. We just have, we just know of the relationship that we have with them personally. The last quote says, I wanted to ask her, hey, mom, you and dad really love each other, don't you? I mean, there's nothing to forgive between you, is there? This is from paragraph 59. Uh, and I chose this again because this is where we see Mike, you know, starting to really come to that realization that people, you know, have secrets, all right? And they have baggage that they don't always necessarily reveal to others, even their loved ones. All right. Now, this video was a bit longer today. And I do want to say thank you for sticking around and, you know, tuning in for both of these sessions of the video and i apologize again for getting disconnected earlier but to wrap things up i just need to take a peek over the agenda because it seems like forever since i've turned around we've completed the graphic organizer we've read the text all right so tomorrow we're going to get to a closer reading of the mustache and take a look at some of the assessment questions uh we'll preview that and we'll go back and i'll reread the text using the guided reading questions okay so tomorrow we'll perform another reading of the text a closer reading uh we'll look at some of my annotations as well that i did not get to today and uh look at the guided questions and in case you missed the opening song before it maybe it did not play because i was playing it through the headphones i'm going to try it now through present presentation mode so here's a little throwback for you
to the Happy Days intro. I think you guys can all see this too. So I'm going to let this play out. And don't forget, I'll be back tomorrow, 11 a.m., uh, for a live unrecorded session in case you have any questions. Uh, and make sure that you click turn in when you complete these assignments, especially when you complete uh, that pre-writing graphic organizer. Tomorrow you'll gain access to the... Um, questions if you uh, are answering them using the Google form. Otherwise, you could you know, obviously get started on the rest of those questions today. All right. Don't forget, wash them hands. I'll see you all tomorrow. All right, guys, until next time, have yourselves a great day.